Welcome, welcome, guys. We are back for another episode of The Lock-In. This is a special pre-recorded WSOP edition of the show. That's basically code for we made it two weeks ago when we were all at home and now we're very busy being live pros slash live tournament anchors. Joining me, as usual, is my fellow Unibet Poker ambassador and at the time of airing, my roommate in Vegas, Dara. How's it going? How's your Vegas been so far? Um, it depends on which universe we're in. Uh we did do a positive universe. Okay. Are we still in the positive universe? Okay. Yeah. I mean, it was amazing to win those three bracelets last week. I just <laughs> expected it. Um, you yeah, know, you... I mean, all 10,000 runner fields as well. Like, what, what, what are the odds of that? We've, we've jumped the shark right out of the gate here. That's terrible. Yeah. Um, joining us this week, fittingly, as we are in the middle of our WSOP. Actually, before you go that too, just, just go on. making the de- our day. But if I move my chair like this, you will see in the background oh. Sasha, my dog, because... I'm here on my own in the house with her and she refuses to be in any other room. So if we hear oh. barking in the middle, you'll, you'll know why. That's okay. Sasha's very welcome. Is this Sasha's debut? I feel like Sasha was on the show a few times a, a little while back. She might have been actually. Yeah, I've, I've just yeah. forgotten. Okay, well, joining us this week, fittingly, as we are in the middle of our WSOP, is our great friend, poker player, poker ambassador, poker podcaster, and I'm delighted to say the WSOP anchor again for this year's main event coverage, Cara Scott, the prodigal daughter returns. Hey, it's great to be on. Thank you for having me. It's uh, it's nice to be back. It's great to have you back. I'm sure on on, on behalf of the entire poker public as well, it's, it's great to have you. Uh, I don't know if you'll have made an appearance yet uh, on the WSOP coverage by the time this goes out. It's probably just about to happen. So we're warming right. you up anyway. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I don't get in until the main event. So, I mean, I, I had to cut it so short this year, but I'm just happy to be back, to be honest. I'm going to fly in, just do like coverage the entire time, fly out and and be exhausted, but super happy. That's the plan. Fantastic. So, well, we're keen to talk loads about the WSOP and your fantastic podcast, of course, as well. But there is a rather thorny subject we have to broach first, I'm afraid. Mm. Ian Simpson, he was our fellow <laughs> Unibet ambassador for five years. He was our chip race newsman for five years. I tweeted recently that our loss is now 888's loss. Two questions. Have you had any professional interactions with Ian yet? And do you know how much Unibet paid 888 to have him taken off our hands? <laughs> you know what? I, I haven't met Ian in person, but we have been actually going back and forth on messaging. And because um, I do some producing work as well for some of the videos for 888. I, I'm not just an ambassador for them, especially over the, the pandemic when I wasn't able to travel. I was kind of desperate to pick up some different things. And I used to be a TV producer like a million years ago. So I've been video producing uh, like the made to learn strategy videos and that kind of thing. And so I've been in touch with Ian for that. And he's been nothing but lovely. So I have no idea what you're talking about. He starts <laughs> off lovely, but once you've worked with him for a few years, it all changes, right, Dara? Yeah, I mean, once you, if you can get past the the, the cat killing and the, and, 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 and the other stuff, <laughs> um, he's fine. I mean, you said, uh, you know, I was going to say that 888 poached him from, from Unibet, but I guess poached isn't the correct term in this case. <laughs> Maybe fish or, or um, I don't know, dumpster dived. I have no idea what Damn. Kind of Damn. Sounds like sour grapes, I'm just going to say. Just, you know, once a member of the chip race team, you know, you just, it's like the mafia. You can't leave. You yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the WSOP, it's the type of year when poker gets a bit more attention. There's a sort of Wimbledon effect, I guess, more people playing online, more people jumping into home games. It's also when a lot of poker controversies pop up as, I suppose, rule breaches, maybe etiquette breaches get talked about in the virtual public square slash (laughs) graffiti wall that is Twitter. Uh, I want to do a little deep dive into a couple of these, and I'd love you both to weigh in. The first is time banking. Now, there are two types of time banking. One is the kind of thing that a lot of people do close to the bubble when they like to slow fold. I, I think I've been accused of that once or twice over the years. The advantage of this is if you play fewer hands than the other tables during this period, when ICM massively restricts the number of hands you're able to play, then you pay fewer blinds and antes. This kind of stalling is normally monitored by TDs and Mm. addressed by going hand for hand early if it becomes a big issue. That's not the type of stalling that we saw a few weeks ago, though, when high stakes poker regular Christoph Vogelsang was taking two to three minutes on pretty much 
every decision in the 25k heads up match, usually for uh, uh, unusually for a high roller, there was no shot clock on this match. And it seemed that Christoph was taking advantage of that fact. Many in the poker community spoke out and Scott Seaver was one of the angriest. Uh, he tweeted what Christoph Olsang is doing is hang on, I get this tweet, is doing in this and every tournament is at a minimum angle shooting, exploiting loopholes in rules for unethical gain. And every player, every and every player, every tournament should make sure a floor has a personal clock on them after five seconds, one that just mm. lasts five seconds too. Pokergo subscribers, of which I was one tuned in to the final, he played against eventual winner Dan Smith. We're delighted to see Dan win. I must say it was pretty bad TV. The two minute pauses before pre-flop actions and checking out of position post-flop uh, was was particularly unengaging viewing. Darren, I'm going to start with you this time. Is this an angle shoot as Scott suggests? I think when you take it to the level that Vogelsang is taking it, then, then yes, it pretty much is an angle shoot. And it... I played it at the table with some very slow players, including Vogelsang once actually in Malta. And it just does, it's, it, 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 it annoys people and it puts them off their game, which, you know, might be the point. Um, hmm. I, I mean, I get that he, uh, he the, the reason he's always given, and, and he was actually asked about it on that day at that table as well. And he said, well, I want to balance because when I have a genuine decision that takes two minutes, I don't want people to know. But I mean, some of the decisions are just so straightforward that it's 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 definitely carrying it too far. Now that said, I would say when it comes to this time banking, you know, I definitely don't approve of that. But I also think there's a lot of bullying around time banking. Sometimes some players who are not particularly slow get the reputation of being slow, and they tend to be the quiet players who don't uh, speak at the table. Um, some of the slowest players I've played against have been very, very verbose players. Like, for example, Will Kasuf might be the slowest of all I've ever played with, uh, <laughs> even including Vogelsang. But he kind of disguises it by the fact, or at least he used to. To be fair to Will, he, he sped up a bit the last time I, I played against him. But he, he used to disguise it with all this table chatter and, 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 and const, constant noise. And that kind of distracted from pe- people from the fact that he was actually taking three or four minutes, let alone two minutes. On, on a lot of decisions. Um, I played at a table, oh, I don't know, I guess it was about seven years ago at a WSOP, and the table was largely recreation, American recreational. And there was one guy who was very loud in particular. He, he, he sort of obviously saw himself as the table captain. And he started picking on this young guy who uh, was clearly an online player and was taking maybe 30 seconds to 90 seconds on a lot of his decisions um, as he thought them out. But he started banging on and, and created this really nasty atmosphere around this kid. Um, as a test, I, 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 um, I timed everybody for two orbits to see if this, guy, if this kid was actually the slowest. And he was actually only the fourth slowest player at the table. And the slowest player at the table was the guy doing all the talking. Because often the action would get to him and he'd be in the middle of telling a story or telling a joke or having fun and he wouldn't look at his cards. So I eventually drew this to his attention. I said, you're actually taking longer time uh, because, <laughs> because the action, when the action's on you, you're in the middle of doing something or you're, or you're distracted. And he got extremely annoyed and he was like, well, that's the fun of poker. Like, uh, you know, I can take <laughs> as much time as I want. And this was literally the same guy who was telling the kid he couldn't take 30 to 90 seconds of decision. And I think a lot of this goes back to sort of people are not necessarily tolerant of people who are very different from them. And, mm. you know, you get different personality types at the table and you just have to accept that people have different personalities. And if you, if you're the type who wants everybody to talk, you can't expect everybody to want to talk. Um, and often it's the quiet players who do get bullied uh, uh, in my experience. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'd that. agree. And honestly, I think, um, I don't remember which player said this, but they were tweeting about it and, um, the basic idea was if what you know Christoph is doing is within the rules, which it is, then maybe it's the rules that need to change. Mm. Like, you know, if there's a blind spot here, or if there's an area where the rules aren't really covering it the way they should, then that's what we need to do. We need to focus on that. And then it's more clear because I don't think it's that fair to kind of put it on the other players to be the ones to call the clock because that is really an uncomfortable place to be until it sort of gets the ball rolling or unless there's like a kind of a bullying situation like you're talking about. Like I played with Will Kasouf, um late in the Irish Open in like 2009 and then on the final table and that was brutally painful and slow. And at one point we had like at the final table on television as well, like the TD had to stand there with a, a clock and 
like time every single action and that's not great. So there needs to be something that kind of deals with that in the rules so that it's not just, you know, up to the poker community to police it because we often don't do that. Well, I think you're right. Dara. Like we don't get the right people. We don't always, you know, sometimes we just, people that annoy us are going to be the targets rather than the people who are actually the slowest or doing it on purpose. Yeah. Okay. So specifically then Cara, I'll put this right back on you. I'm against the shot clock for 1500 events. There's a lot of five, 600 quid events. I think that would be ridiculous and un manageable frankly but yeah. these 25k high rollers there's 50ks and 100ks there's even a 250k i think in there somewhere does the wsp need to implement a shot clock for those games i mean i think they need to talk to the players who are going to be playing those games i think that's the you know the people who whose opinion matters the most in that context because they're putting up so much money and there's so much rake and like they're the ones who are going to have to say yes or no i think personally um but yeah i can't see why not like Really, I, I don't think we should make everything, every decision because it's good for television, which is weird because I'm a broadcaster and that's kind of my job. But when it comes to poker, we're looking at like what's best for the game. So in terms of the experience by the other players at the table. So if it's really painfully slow and someone's doing something that's really annoying, then that's not a great experience for other people. But I mean, we're not going to be looking at new players in the whatever the 200, 250K buy-ins, right? So then it's all about... TV and it's about the integrity of the game. And so if you want the integrity of the game to be respected, you do talk to the players who are actually playing in those games and the ones that are affected. And they probably have really good ideas about what to do. I mean, poker players always have ideas about what to do. So, yeah. <laughs> well, you mentioned that the TV side of us separating out the, the right and wrong for a moment. Is it terrible for poker as a spectator sport when this happens? Or is it weirdly good because... It becomes a talking point and gives commentators and pundits like us something to rage about. Oh, yeah. I mean, we kind of like for the hours and hours and hours that are live poker tournaments, you need to have villains. You need to have character traits that are like super annoying or super interesting. You've got to have stuff to talk about. But I still don't think it's worth it. I really don't. Because at, at some point, it just gets to be so tedious that it makes the game so much longer that the action, which is the actual like thing that people are there to really watch, it gets slowed down so much that it's just not, it's not watchable sometimes. Yeah, I think that's the right answer. And actually, it's an identical answer to the one I gave Laura Cornelius when she asked me that question in relation to me having to yeah. play half a day with William Kasuf at the Irish <laughs> Open recently. I, I think, yes, while characters is fine, just put yourself in the shoes of the poor unfortunates who are at that table and it's just mm. miserable it really is it becomes a, a very unpleasant experience Christoph was the villain for a few days on social media but there was a bit of pushback as well notably Mike Timex McDonald um, maybe felt the reaction against him was too strong he said mm. Christoph has among the most tilting antics in the game but he's a competitor he shows up to win he's one of the best to ever do it and honestly think everyone at home should be trying to figure out how to win themselves rather than criticize someone who has figured it out Dara do you think the reaction was justified or overblown clearly Christoph is a, a lovely quite gentle guy and never comes across as someone who wants to tilt his opponents in fact Dan even said it right after the match that whenever he asked Christoph to speed up a little he did do his best yeah I think uh, I mean I, I, that one time I played with Christoph and when he was slow as I said he um it, it 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 annoyed people a little bit at the table, but he but he was a very gentle presence and very pleasant presence as well, um, and very very polite. So nobody sort of really went for him. And I mean, on the TV thing, it's not there, there's absolutely no onus on players to create good TV. I mean, they have bought into the tournament. They, the the organizers don't give them extra money because they're on TV. I mean, that used to be a thing in the uh, in the old days. But you know, at the end of the day, they are essentially giving the the tournament organizers and the TV their their image rights for free. So, I don't think there's any onus on the players. I also do think that I mean, we hear this every year, and it's often cast as a as a American versus um, European thing. The idea that all the Europeans are incredibly slow. Um, because some of the most prominent uh, slow players like Vogelsang and Kasuf happen to be European. But it's not that clear-cut to divide either. Um, there are some very slow American players too. And I, 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 I mean, it's, it is annoying to be at the table, but, but 
I mean, in some ways, I find the whole reaction even more annoying. It's like, oh, really? We're going to have that discussion again? I guess, I guess, I guess we're we're we're, uh, we're we're tired of bitching about other people's markups, and now we're onto the uh, people <laughs> who are playing too slow. <laughs> yeah, there is the, there is a certain number of topics we have to sort of cover annually at the same. Uh, moving on to another one of those, or actually maybe we've never really done this one before or, or done it in this way, late registration. Mm. It is well known that Dara and I late reg the WSOP main event last <laughs> year straight into day two. Admittedly, more as a necessity as we were flying in last minute uh, after the US travel ban was lifted. But it's fair to say that we also don't mind a last minute late reg in other games too. We both raise our own short stack games and there's clearly an ICM premium on a stack bought when half the field are gone. In a lot of the re-entry events at the WSOP, 1500 quid type events that Darren and I will often be jumping into, our approach is usually to get in from the start. But if we bust then fire our second bullet as a last minute one. This is a, a live strategy we've seen deployed by the likes of Helmet for years. Hundreds of players do it. In fact, you just have to look at the queues at late registration right at the last moment. It's also a pretty common approach to online poker if you're trying to maximize your hourly with lots of games, spinning plates in that kind of way. There is a section on end game poker strategy all about the advantages of late registering there. So maybe you could summarize and we could take the conversation from there. Yeah, I mean, it, I, as you said, it's, it's purely an ICM equity boost. And, and typically, it depends on exact, exactly how many people have been eliminated, how near to the bubble you are, and how, how spread out the stacks are. But in a normal tournament, it can be, it, 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 it'll almost never be less than 10%. And it will it would be unusual for it to be more than thirty percent, but that's still a pretty reasonable edge. I mean, if you're coming to a fifteen hundred with a thirty percent equity boost, that means your your buying is now worth nineteen fifty, almost two grand right from the start. Now, the reason what the reason why we specifically put it into the book is that. Pros have known this for years, uh, and, and, and it has been a very common approach among online players to, to max late reg everything except knockout tournaments. Um, but recreations don't, and recreations had sort of, uh, I mean, in, ideas that kind of made uh, sense from a common sense point of view, but actually just turned out to be plain wrong, where they thought, well, late regging must be bad because you're only buying X number of big blinds, and that must be bad, and half the time you bust the, f- the first time you're all in, and uh, so it's so, so, so you're just gambling. So it, it wasn't widely uh, ex- accepted or even recognized among recreationals what an advantage this was. And that kind of rubbed me up the wrong way because, you know, uh, I did a webinar uh, a few days ago for Faraz Jacka's trading site, and I talked about this at length. And I showed that, you know, if somebody comes in with half the field gone and they get this 10% equity boost, that 10% doesn't come from nowhere. It's a zero-sum game. It comes from the people who registered right from the start. So retrospectively, they're thousand dollars or whatever it is is devalued to 980 or 990 dollars so they're at a double disadvantage first of all they're probably uh you know if they're recreational players they're probably losing players anyway but this is this is giving them an, an, an added disadvantage so i felt it was quite important to get that information out there uh, to recreational players so you know even if they want to read from the start and most of them do at least they should understand why it's such an advantage uh to um to, to later edge and, and 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 they should be putting pressure on organizers not to allow it to to, uh, to go on too late like it's sh- in some tournaments you can you can later edge in where you know there's only 20 to 30 percent of the field left and now the advantage just becomes absolutely massive and if recreations aren't aware of that aren't aware that they're 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 losing out in those spots i think you know essentially the wool has been pulled over their eyes last year seemed to be the first year there was huge uproar about this i'm not saying it was necessarily because of the book and people everybody suddenly realized but matasau for example went on a on a on a, on a fairly heated rant about late reg and and you can you can completely understand from the recreation's point of view it's not just about the money it's also about you know they've played for an entire day they've They've struggled and battled to get to day two. And then they see a guy buy straight into day two um, with a significant amount of the field gone. And that does, just doesn't feel right to them. Yeah. On the subject, actually, you, you mentioned Madison there. There's a funny sort of twist in the Madison approach to this one. Uh, he tweeted a little while ago and it caught my eye. I'll be late regging the 10K dealer's choice today after the basketball game. I'll be late regging a lot of the 10Ks <laughs> this year as I feel it's an edge and I'm going to prove it. If I'm wrong, I'll be the first to admit it, but I know I'm not. But I've been wrong before. Hashtag positivity, whatever that is. <laughs> hell of a time. I have no idea. This is just a standard. I think it might be just an automatic hashtag that goes on all those tweets these days. Last year at the WSOP, Madison was shaming everyone, as Dara said, who late reg. But he now seems to be going for a sort of, if I can't beat him, I'm going to join them approach. Kara, it's obviously baked into the structure. So 
clearly there's nothing wrong. No one's doing anything wrong uh, by, by late regging. But should the WSOP reduce the period of late registration, as Dara mentions there? There are some smaller buy-in tournaments. Uh, I think these are the ones you are mentioning uh, specifically, Dara, where you can buy 10 bigs. Maybe there was one that you could even buy eight bigs and are immediately into the last 25% of the field. Mm. Yeah, I think in those tournaments, for sure, um, you're looking again at the experience for the player. And if most of the players in that field are going to be people who aren't playing really large events, that kind of thing, they're they're partly there for the experience of it. And I'm also someone who late regs. I mean, at the World Series, not really when I was playing kind of the circuit in Europe, because some tournaments start at like five o'clock in the afternoon here or in the evening. And so as, as on someone on the other side of that, sitting down at a table at five o'clock and thinking, you know, oh my God, this is going to last so long and it's going to be a really late night and not being able to start your table because there just aren't enough players yet. Or, you know, that's really frustrating and it's not a good experience. However, I mean, somebody's noon is someone else's 5 p.m. So I guess you can't, I I can't really complain because I have late reg. But yeah, there should be, I think, a limit clearly. But I also think that players are looking at it not in the right way. Like instead of saying, okay, this, this pro who is clearly more experienced than me and knows what they're doing has decided to sit down with 10 bigs on day two. And I didn't have to play against them the entire day yesterday. Mm. Like, come on. Like there's an advantage there too. You, if all of these pros are going to be playing later on, then you get there on time and you can play and get yourself comfortable, especially if you're not used to live poker and all of those things without, you know, having to face like a ton of pros at your table. That's not a terrible thing. Yeah, that's definitely a counterpoint made as well by our tournament manager at Unibet, Leo hmm. Magnius. He, he talks about how at some level the amateur players like getting into a more amateur field beginning yeah. splash around enjoy the experience of it and as you say okay yes it's maybe a little bit devastating when you've grinded all day to you know maybe double your stack by the end of the day and then the pro arrives in with the last hour of the day to go immediately gets a you know ace king against queens hits the ace doubles up and you're like oh he's had a completely different experience to get to the same place but yeah uh, but how often does that really happen most of the time that's not going to happen like <laughs> Hmm. people are when they see it that one time they don't remember all the other times that the pro came in with a tiny stack and tried to flip and then lost and that was it or you know like i don't know i think that we just assume the worst like possibility or the worst interpretation of things all the time when we're sitting there like it's terrible that they've come in and they have the same stack as me is it though like (laughs) Uh, there's still someone, someone could have just arrived at the table from another table with a 10 big blind stack. Like it, that could be, it's the same dynamic for you as a player sitting there. You're sitting there, someone shows up with 10 big blinds. It's a new table. Like it's the same thing mm. in terms of so, your experience. It's the same thing. It sure is. Well, Dara, where would you make the cutoff? I suppose the best way to look at it is maybe the number of big blinds you would allow the cutoff to be. Um, first of all, I don't agree. That's the best way to look at it because you could have a very, very fast structure. Um, uh, and, 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 and it's, I think, I think it's more about what percentage of the field ha- has been, has been busted. I think, I think once mm, okay. you go past about 25%, it starts to become fairly major. Mm. Um, the, the advantage of later edging. Um, the other thing is if you are going to let people late red very, very late and then give them a ridiculous amount of big blinds, like, the WSOP main event where you come in day two with 80 big blinds having skipped the entirety of day one. I don't think that's a good thing. I think, I think there should be some maybe punishment factor that you have to come in with less big blinds if you are going to do that. So uh, I think uh, number of players eliminated, but I also think time, like mm. uh, an entire day of late reg just seems uh, over the top. And, um, you know, I think the original idea for late reg was maybe people can't get there on time and you don't want to punish somebody just because they're five minutes late. Now they can't get into the tournament. Um, so, so, you know, when I first started seeing late reg in tournaments, live tournaments, it was like one or two levels. And then obviously organizers saw the obvious benefits of um, allowing it. And then once so many tournaments became re-entry, it became even more the case because it was now, well, let's leave it open long enough for lots of people to bust and, and, and be able to re-enter. Um, but yeah, I think I think p- probably somewhere around four levels feels about right. Um, say, say with a one hour clock, um, that allows somebody to be reasonably late and still get in, but it doesn't confer on them a massive advantage by doing so. Very good. Well, we are putting our names, as you guys might have already heard, 
uh, the Chip Race brand, if you like our names, the Chip Race brand on an upcoming Unibet Open Malta mystery bounty event. And with it being a particular advantage in that format, uh, Dara's done the maths on that. I think there's a seminar out there on that one as well. We're insisting that we have a shorter period of late, Reg. I think something along the lines of a few hours, similar to what Dara has just said there, seems appropriate. So hopefully we're going to sort of address that within the context of, of a tournament where at least, uh, as I said, putting our names on. Finally, guys, on WSOP stuff, I want you to make a few predictions. These are going to be quick fire answers from both of you. Cara, you go first in each case. The main oh event, boy. 10K runners, do you think it will get more or less? Less. Less. Okay, yeah. Dara? Less. Less as well. Yeah, I think I think 10K is not a bad number and it might get close to it, but I, I think that's probably, yeah, maybe just shy of that. The mystery bounty tournament that's going to be on just before the main event, guaranteeing that magical $1 million envelope. Will it be a huge success or will it be a flop? A huge success, I think. Massive. It's going to be absolutely massive success. Yeah. yeah. The one the one million guarantee bounty, I think that's going to really drive it. And I mean, only 30% of the prize pool is going into the bounty. So that means they need uh they they, they need about five million in the pool to for the for the bounty uh prize not to just be the entire bounty pool and not much <laughs> else. Uh so and it's a one thousand. So that means that that the, they're clearly expecting at least five thousand runners. I think they're actually going to smash that. Um yeah. I'm pretty sure that'll be the biggest event apart from the um main event. Yeah, it does feel like the perfect opener. I think a lot of people may be gearing up by going out for that one as their warmer upper and a bit of fun and then straight into the main right after. We already have one woman with a bracelet, Kate Cop, who won event one. How many women will leave with some wrist candy from the desert this year? I'm going to say four, including the ladies event. Um, I'm going to go three, uh, including the ladies event as well. Uh, I mean, it has to be one, obviously, unless unless the nightmare scenario of some man pays 10,000 and, and ends up with it somehow. Uh, but um, I mean, I think women tend to only make three to five percent of the field. So yep. um, it's reasonable to assume three to five percent of the winners as well. Mm-hmm. Very good. OK, how many amateurs? This is a question often asked. How many amateurs will make the main event final table? Hard to distinguish maybe exactly who is an amateur. A lot of semi-pros out there, but let's go with it anyway. Amateurs, Cara. Um, pure amateurs, I'm going to say four. Oh, that's a big number, Dara. Yeah, that, that is a very big number. Yeah. Pure amateurs, I'm going to say one. If, if we count people like Gary Gates, who, you know, work in poker, but aren't necessarily full time poker players. At the time they made the final table, three, maybe. Yeah, I just feel like kind of two is around the number I would have gone for. So, yeah, you're, <laughs> you're, you're either side of me there. OK, this one. And Barry Carter asked me to ask you this one. Phil Helmet to get his first ever penalty for bad behavior. Yes or no? Doubtful. Uh, I doubt it. <laughs> I can't see it happening ever. Yeah, zero chance. I just don't see this ever happening. I mean, that, that number is now reduced by the fact that the poor man has COVID and will miss a couple of weeks. So yeah, he's, he's coming a bit more muted. Yeah. Also, apparently he's suffering from brain fog. So um, um, interesting to see how, what, what effect that has on his mood. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But maybe. Yeah. Who knows? But maybe it'd be a very different sort of helmet who will appear more likely to get a uh, a penalty or, or perhaps less as well. OK, switching gears now on our last Chip Race episode and our last lock in actually as well with Alex O'Brien. We spoke a little bit about diversity and inclusivity in the game. Cara, you put out an absolutely brilliant tweet a few weeks ago. You said diversity, meaning we don't share common values is harmful bullshit. I share far more common values with people from backgrounds and live uh, and lives different to mine than I do with so many of the white evangelical evangelical racist horror shows I grew up with or see now. It's certainly very true that people from different walks of life can get to a very similar place in their ethics and in their values. Can you elaborate a little bit on that tweet? Yeah, I just kept seeing people talking about how bad diversity is or how it's not a automatic good to be wanting diversity because it means that we're being fragmented and you know we don't share the the same values with people. And I just I do I think that's absolute bullshit. Like, 
the idea that just because someone has a different background from me means that we don't value the exact same things like our families, our friends, our health, security, healthcare, you know, like freedom, like, come on, I have way more in common with people that I didn't grow up with or like people I didn't grow up with. I, I grew up in a very kind of evangelical Christian, very small town, Northern Alberta, and like my friends are pretty far diverse from that, but are very much like me in a lot of ways. And I think that also just informs me as a person. I mean, I don't want to have friends that are all the same or family that are all the same as me. I think that's just bullshit. <laughs> and and yeah. Dara, how would you relate or, or maybe not relate to that? Uh, my guess is you might relate in, in terms of your own upbringing and, and sort of the life you lead now. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not really in contact with that many people I grew up with uh, anymore. And that's, I mean, I think that's, you know, for, for people who, who, you know, who leave their hometown, etc., you very quickly find that there's much more people you connect with um, in new places. It, uh, th there's th this whole for socialization. I mean, poker is a for socialization situation that you can't really choose who you sit down at the table with. <laughs> um, but, you know, growing up is the same. Like, you can't really choose where you're born and who all the people around you are. It's only as you get older that you get to start making those choices and uh yeah so i really on that on, on, on the diversity thing like i also think that people often focus on it too narrow they, they just look you know they talk about it as a gender thing for example we need to get more women to the game they talk about it in terms of sexual orientation we have to be more tolerant um uh and then they talk about it in terms of race you know we have to get more uh non-white people into the game but there are but there are other areas too where we could definitely be more diverse and one of the ones that i keep going back to is just you know different personality types be be uh, be accepting of different personality types people probably forget how our beef with daniel legranum started but it was a blog where he wrote where he more or less said Everybody who isn't like me is bad for poker. If you don't have my personality type, I don't. I don't like quiet people at the table. I don't like introverted <laughs> people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, our argument was like all of those people are perfectly. Uh, they have just as much right to be at the poker table as you, and they don't have to behave like you uh, to uh, to meet your approval. And I, I still see that a lot in poker. I, I see people complaining about people more or less on their personality type. You know, oh, they're too quiet. They they don't say anything at the table, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's people's right. If if mm -hmm. if, if you're a natural introverted person there's nothing worse than finding yourself at a table with eight extroverts who are all insisting that you you talk and laugh at all their jokes um and and you often see bullying in the in those in those situations as I, and I, like as i said earlier you know that'll be the player who will get picked on as being too slow even if they're not actually the slowest at the table that's the player that will get picked on for other stuff as well and um i would just ask people to be more mindful that you know not everybody is exactly like you and you have to be tolerant of different personality types mm. i think that's a really good place to start because if we're we're not even able to be tolerant of people who are just different personality types than yep. us. I mean, how are we going to be dealing with disabilities at the table and and so many more things in terms of, yeah, race and gender and sexuality. And uh, it's just, it's really, I, I don't know. We have a really long way to go, I think. And just assuming that everyone should be like us is where the problem starts because that is just the most arrogant place to start from it's like i'm amazing and everyone should be like me okay yeah. great thanks yeah. like nice contribution thanks very much like yeah. i don't know i i, I want to talk to people who are different than me and i want to not talk to people who are different than me but sit in in quiet happy silence and play my cards like not everything is a spotlight and not everything should be a spotlight and not everything is a, I don't know, Instagrammable moment. And we don't have to always be on, like, just take a breather and be a person. And remember that people didn't all have to fit into very narrow categories once upon a time, although maybe we did and even more so in many ways, but we just don't have to live like that. I don't know. The older I get, the more I realize how much of everything is bullshit. So, <laughs> so I've said it again. You said it first, though, when you read my tweets. You're very intolerant it's okay. of bullshit, Cara. <laughs> I am. And also horseshit. That's a so, terrible yeah. intolerance you have of, of, of oh. people who are intolerant. It's true. Um, no, no, obviously, yeah, a, a sort of a live and let live approach would, would be a great starting point for most of these things. Yeah. Finally, Cara, we want to talk about your wonderful podcast, The Heart of Poker. Oh, Congratulations thanks. on your GP 
I nomination for the show this year. Very well deserved. Thank you. The very idea much. of the show is that you interview your guest using a modified version of questions devised by psychologists as a sort of shortcut to intimacy. The result is some uniquely personal interviews with poker players. But what strikes me, maybe above that, as a regular listener, is that it has actually become a show where there is a slow peeling back of the onion of you, the host. Was that your plan from the start, that it would be a way for you to reveal a bit more of yourself than you ever have before? It, um, oh, that's a tough question because it kind of was in a way, but not sort of this much, I think. Um, I think the fact that I was doing this podcast over the pandemic and over the lockdown, and which for me, unfortunately, lasted you know, much longer than it did for most people. Like I finally was able to go and see my parents in Canada, I think last month. <laughs> so it was like a solid two and a half years of not doing anything, not seeing anyone, not seeing a single member of my family or my friends or anything for that whole entire period. So I think part of that is what comes out in it. And I think I said in one of the last couple, it was like, it's like I've invited everyone in into my slow descent into madness. Come, come watch <laughs> me disintegrate as a person, as my psyche is unfolding. But um, it's been really interesting for me because I've enjoyed being able to connect with people on that level and talk to people I wouldn't normally and other people I do. Like, I mean, Lon McCarran was a, a guest of mine and he's also a friend. And we've had some very deep, very personal conversations about loss and grief and all kinds of things just between the two of us. So doing it, you know, uh, while recording was kind of a, a strange step, but yeah, I didn't expect to be quite that open. I never really have been that open. So I don't know. I'm still considering it. Um, Ali Najad said he offered to come on and host it for me and ask me all the questions. Um, and I, I still don't think um, I could do that, but we'll see. You do sort of answer your own questions with the yeah. guest. I think that's sort of part and parcel of it. So I'm not sure it's necessary. I think <laughs> in a way by doing it where you're the guest and he's the host, I think what is a very nice slow unfurling would be maybe done too quick. And actually, I think it's actually happening anyway over the course of it, as I said, right. for a regular listener. Um, and well, I think that's I, maybe nicer. I, yeah. And I've been really gratified to have like the support like you for, for one, like right from the beginning, like giving me help in the beginning and, you know, we nearly fell out, Cara. I was very worried. You had me scared. That was long. my <laughs> issue. Not yours though. Let's be honest. You, cause you came in and you were like, I have some unsolicited advice and I, <laughs> it was not a good time. I'll be honest with you. I was, yeah, not, not up for unsolicited advice. I was basically like, look, I'm falling apart and everything's <laughs> terrible. I can't take it right now. So take your advice. And no, but I did appreciate. And so I do actually want to say right now, You're thank you for that. Advice. <laughs> unsolicited, unappreciated. Yeah. Unimportant. I don't think I responded very well. So I apologize. And I'm no, no, God, and no, don't I, thank you. I felt so terrible because it, like, oh, I God, suppose I'm sorry. I, I, I immediately loved the concept that I immediately was really getting into the show. So I, and I, and obviously at the beginning of any new project, any new production, any new anything, you know, you're, you're sort of finding your, you know, yeah. best versions of doing things. So I, I, you know, I did, I absolutely yeah. fell into the, I was guilty of, of unsolicited no. advice because I was so invested in it. Kind of like, I love this. I love this. Here's one note. And you were like, fuck off with your notes. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Because the thing was, and here's the truth. Your notes were spot on. And there were also things that I'd seen in my own delivery and hated and just did not have the capacity to change at that point. Because I was literally not sleeping. I had like a two-year-old. Yeah. I was trying to like just deal with everything at that point without any kind of like a ton of help really. And so, yeah, I, I saw it, I hated it. And then when you said it, I was just like, boom, my head exploded. <laughs> and I am sorry. I did not. No, no, again, that no, well. no, no, no. Um, so, so Tara, I suppose with, with the art of poker, Cara has a very solid, unique selling point that the format's very different. And I think that's something we feel is really important. We've often spoke about the need to distinguish yourself in the poker podcasting space. It's fair to say that a lot of content is very samey. Mm -hmm. A lot of podcasters or, or would-be podcasters have come to us sort of with their general idea. And a lot of the time it does just feel a little bit like a lot of other shows where they just want to have somebody on. And they sort of have the confidence to think that, oh, you can just not really prepare and have a conversation, turn it on, and then it just kind of will happen. <laughs> and because I'm so wonderfully interesting, it'll be fine. But in reality, like we like I, we put unspeakable, unspeakable amounts of time prepping this show uh, so that hopefully both this show and the other one come across 
a little bit more tight or a little bit more uh, focused or whatever. But but that really does require both the structure that we created and loads of work behind the scenes. So I think when people sort of, you know, enter the space, they, they sometimes don't realize all the hard work that I'm sure Cara's put in as well. Because again, as I said, her show has a unique selling point. The other thing is, Cara has kept going. I think you're on to like episode 34, 35 right now. And I know, Dara, you have a stat about podcasts and how long the average one lasts. Yeah, very few actually get to episode six, which is... Wow. Um, and, the, and the vast majority of episodes, their most listened to two episodes is episode one um, because all their friends listen and then less of them listen to episode two and less listen to episode three. They, it's literally a straight line down, um, which Ouch. to be fair was kind of the chip race at the start too. We didn't really exactly book that trend. Um, there were, but, there, but, but if you push through it, you can kind of reach a point where you do actually start to grow. But I think, uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of guys just don't get to episode six. And I think the issue, as you said, is that everybody's following the Joey Ingram um, model almost, uh, just talking to somebody. And, you know, Joey's brilliant is brilliant to that, but everybody else isn't brilliant at that. And <laughs> it's very, very samey. Like my, my favorite podcasts, they do, even if it's a fairly light format, they do have a format. Th- Thinking Poker, for example, they always start with a strategy piece and then they they go on to have a, a have a guest and you kind of know what you're getting. Um, but above and beyond that, um, Andrew clearly puts a lot of work into preparation because he doesn't just have the same interview every time. He, he almost invariably gets a very interesting interview out of whoever he interviews. Um, so I think that sort of pre-production work shows as well. Um, I think a, a lot of people do just think like, we'll just turn on our, on our microphones and we'll have a chat. Um, I have listened to some podcasts that started off great, you know, two guys talking about different things in the poker world. And then 30 shows in, it was one guy complaining that he didn't have a job anymore. He didn't know he was going to be ever, ever be employed. Again, oh. and, the, and the other guy talking about his downswing, and it was like, yeah, this is not what this is. This is not what we tune in for. I mean, this is obviously deeply interesting to you, um, and maybe if we, and if it was one week, he would be tolerant. But when it becomes like seven weeks in a row, it's like, nope, I'm out now. Sorry, um, yeah. So that's kind of the thing. Uh, I mean, our format is with the chip race in particular is you know kind of different because it's a magazine format. Um, there are a few other uh, carefully thought out formats. Cars, obviously, um, Jennifer Shahadi is the grid as well. Another excellent idea where, where there's a sort of a concept. Um, I think you have to be careful with that stuff too, because it, ha- it needs to be a good concept, something with legs, um, because otherwise you can, you can just end up making the same show over and over again as well. I'm not going to name any names there because I probably would offend a few people, but there are some people who have sort of tried to have the concept and then five shows in, they've gone, okay, I'm kind of, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter who I have on now. It's kind of always the same. Yeah, the other thing I suppose, and you sort of touched on it there, is how sparing I think we are of revealing ourselves. You know, obviously people know all about your running background, and there are little maybe touch points in our when, lives. You weren't that sparing when we uh, interviewed poor Alex O'Brien on the last lock-in, and it was so hot <laughs> in the room that it's, the, the minute you we stopped recording, you immediately ripped your shirt off. And, <laughs> I can't believe you're going to out me like this. Because we're actually getting to the point of the interview where that's happening again. (laughs) We're getting to the point of the interview where that's happening again. I'm getting really hot. Sorry, it's 40 degrees in Malta and I'm boiling up. So when it gets to about the 30 minute mark, I'm usually in a sweat box here. (laughs) And uh, and yeah, I thought it was just every time we had a a female guest, you ended up. (laughs) Swe- sweating like a pervert. You're such a bastard, Ogar, you to out me like this on the show. That's terrible. Stop pulling back the curtain. That's the whole point. Don't pull back the curtain is my advice to podcasters. Uh, but yeah, no, I think you, you don't really want to reveal, or, or, or if you do, you want to do it gently. And that's why I suppose what you said about Ali's offer, I was almost like, oh my God, no, because I think exactly mm. what you do is perfect, is that it's happening, but it's happening really slowly. And that's what keeps the concept mm. and gives it legs. I'm glad. I'm really glad. Yeah, I didn't want it to be a gimmick. I, I wanted it to have a good structure that I could follow that would kind of lead it and, you know, keep it one thing while being a you know different episode each time, but still that one thing. But I didn't want it to become a gimmick. So, yeah, I that was a t- that- tough thing. I think the fact that you're withholding of the the love, because obviously the point is that you fall in love and I haven't noticed you falling in love with any guests yet. So maybe <laughs> the ultimate journey will be that. It could be. It could be. Yeah. Stand out for me actually were um, episodes with Barney Boatman. I loved that one. Oh, Jamie yeah. Kerstetter was great. Brandon mm-hmm. Jack Harris. He's always great, but you mm-hmm. ex- especially uh, got a great interview out of him. And a very recent one with Ape Styles. I, ha- I will admit I haven't watched or listened to the, the Lon episode yet. I'm dying to watch mm-hmm. the, uh, listen to that now that you've said it. But do you have any personal favorites yourself? 
Um, gosh, the ones that you've mentioned, I think are probably favorites for me. I think Barney, like that was just because we're good friends and I like him as a person. And so being able to kind of do that was really nice. Um, and yeah, Ape Styles. I was actually in Canada visiting my parents when I uh, recorded that. And it was, I, I even said it in the episode, it was, it was a little strange for me because when I first met him in person, we were sitting at a table together at the World Series and he looks at, like just an uncanny amount like uh, my first husband who has passed. And it was just shocking for me. And I kept staring at him the whole time. And, and so then we never spoke after that. And then actually having this really long, very thoughtful conversation and getting to know who he was as a person was just really, I don't know, there's something very special about that for me. And I, that I think has got to be one of my favorites. Absolutely. Yeah, it really was brilliant. Uh, we've had Jonathan on the show a few times uh, he did an interview and the, he did a strategy as well. And actually, even with the strategy, we got him talking about stuff because mm. he's such a great person to talk to. He's such yeah. a, a warm person. And I think people maybe when they see him because, he, he you know, he's a muscly guy, he's, you know, probably yeah. looks like a hard guy. But actually, he's a real gentleman and, and a real yeah. you know, kind, thoughtful person. Yeah, yeah so yeah, much very, warmth. Very much gentle giant. Yeah, I mean, we've had him on pretty much everything. We could have him on because we enjoyed the first one so much. We had him on Chip Riz. Mm-hmm. We had him back for strategy. We had him on, on the lock-in as well. Um, and I've done uh, another seminar with him as well. He's just a great guy to talk to always. Um, and I think all, all the people you mentioned kind of fall into that category. And I think that's something which is sometimes forgotten too. The, the, the guests are really important uh, to any show. And also irrespective of your um your format or your or your concept you need to be a good interviewer um mm-hmm. like i did i did a podcast with uh, lee davy who has it isn't out yet but lee's an amazing interviewer he just he just yeah. gets a different interview out of everybody he interviews um mm-hmm. because because of his approach yeah lee's especially good and, and and the fact that he's interviewed you dara made me feel like maybe he's tiptoeing back into the poker space he obviously left it a, f- a few years ago devastated that he did sort of at the peak of his powers both writing and presenting for triton and different things and mm-hmm. yeah one of my favorite people in poker so I, I do hope he's maybe thinking about coming back on a full-time basis last up cara okay um I want to try something if you'll indulge me. If you don't want to, if okay. you're not up for it, it's okay. But this is the very last thing I promise. You tweeted a few weeks ago how you haven't been in front of TV cameras for a while. You obviously are back now on the WSOP broadcast. And you said, I might have to do the extra second of pause when the cameras <laughs> turn on before I start talking just once. So my producer thinks I've frozen. Can we practice that now? I, I'll be the director and I'll call action. Can you do your best? deer in the headlights impression the, the only thing is rather than immediately pause our camera won't actually switch to you unless you say something so i'm gonna have to like so you're gonna have to maybe introduce yourself and then do the deer in the headlights are we ready got it okay and action hello everyone i'm kara scott And welcome to the World Series of Poker. <laughs> do it, please do it, please do it just once on the record. I think that would be absolutely oh. brilliant. Especially mm-hmm. if enough people know about it and know it's coming. Because some people will just have that horrible moment. Some people will just be in stitches. It's, it's yeah, like I'm, starting to, I'm starting to wonder, Dave, if, if you, you've actually been freezing up throughout this as well. And I'm wondering whether you, it, this is now deliberate or <laughs> is, it, it is genuinely your internet. Um, He's just been doing it the whole time. It's like a run and gag now. It's a wind up. It's a wind up. Um, Actually, no, I think I have said that as a joke because I really do actually want to do it, but I like my producers and I don't want to, you know, make them just freak out. But also in case it does happen, I kind of want an out where people think, oh, she's doing that thing. She's doing that thing. And be like, yeah, no, I was totally doing that thing. I, I, I did not go blank. I've got this under control. I'm a professional. Yeah, <laughs> you certainly are. Well, look, on that note, to our fabulous guest, Kara Scott, we are looking forward to all the fantastic WSOP coverage coming up. Thank you. Me too. I can't wait. And to Darrow Kearney, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm really disappointed you didn't um, thank Sasha as well. Oh, sorry, Sasha. It's been a wonderful cameo. You didn't bark once, so I suppose that's good. <laughs> Yeah, I think we slow rolled our guests at the start. They, 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 they don't like the shows where it's just the two of us. And um, I, 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 we, we did make it look like maybe Sasha was the guest for, for a brief minute. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a million. 